Awesome, you gotta watch out on the front row, you might get candy in your face. Merry Christmas, we're glad to see you guys with us this morning. We're gonna keep singing, but before we do, why don't you find about three or four people, tell them Merry Christmas. Maybe you let them know if you've got all your Christmas shopping done yet or not. You probably know this song, it's Amazing Grace. Let's sing it out together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found.
Let's go have a seat. Good morning, church. How y'all doing this morning? Are you glad to be here? I'm glad you're here. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm glad I'm here and I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see y'all this morning. We're going to continue to worship by bringing our tithes and offerings to Jesus in just a moment. But before we do that, let me take a moment to talk to you about something that's going to be happening next week. Next week is our Christmas offering. This is something we do every year at this time of the year as a way to help our church end the year well and start the new year strong. But this year we're looking to make some strategic investments in vital ministries around here. We're looking to make investments in discipleship, in our next generation ministries, our students and our kids, as well as making investments in the kingdom of God through local and foreign missions. But ultimately, the Christmas offering always boils down to one thing. It's about helping people experience life change through Jesus Christ. People like Charlie and Kelly. Why don't you watch their story on the screen? I'm Charlie. I'm Kelly. And we are the worship leaders for Revolution Student Ministries upstairs. In our lives, there was just an absence of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then we came here and, for example, the absence of Christ in our life was um, we never talked about God. We never talked about um, how our life worked because God was doing something in our life. It was like, oh, that was a coincidence. But yeah. that's a big change. It's like, oh, we feel God working in our life. Not only did Charlie make his confession of faith for the first time here, um, but I think that we grew in our walk um, as Christians exponentially um, faster, it seems. Um, just because it was such a promotion of get involved and get in a group and um, so yeah we kind of hopped around we did welcome team first and then uh, we hosted a small group and kind of got our feet wet in different areas and um, then Dwayne asked us if we would get involved with student ministry and that was not something that we had really expected to get involved in but came up here and found out that we absolutely adore the kids and um, feel like music is uh, where our ministry lies where we're good at and so we feel blessed to be able to be in ministry um, together together Just serving together it's not something that we take for granted. I think that it's something not a lot of couples really get to experience, and we feel really blessed to be able to serve together. It's just, it's interesting to look over the last three years and see how the chips have just kind of fallen, and God's just kind of made it very evident that you can't even run from your calling. It'll find you, so. So it feels good to be where, I'm supposed to, where, where we were supposed to be. Now, I don't even think I know, like, a full secular song. <laughs> just know all worship songs, which is awesome, you know, but, you know, it's just kind of weird how everything works out, you know, like, he's got a plan for everything that we're doing. The stories like that that enable me to stand before you this morning and ask you to bring the best offering that you can possibly bring for the Christmas offering next week. What does your best look like? Well, that's different things for different people. For Susan and I, we always try to bring as much to Jesus as we would give to somebody else on our Christmas list uh, on a particular Christmas. So maybe that's what your best looks like. Maybe it looks like something else. Whatever it is, put your best offering next week in one of these Christmas offering envelopes and bring it with you next Sunday because here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to do two separate offerings next Sunday. Our regular tithes and offerings we'll do like we're doing right now. But then towards the end of the service, we're going to take communion together. When we come to the communion tables, we're going to bring our Christmas offering and lay them on the table and bring them to Jesus together. So be prepared for that next week. All right, let's get ready to worship a little bit more. Can we do that? Can we worship Jesus some more? We'll worship him through our tithes. We're going to sing a little bit more, and then we're going to prepare our hearts to receive the word of God. So let's stand. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give back to you today. We ask you to take our offerings, use them for your kingdom, use them for your glory. In Jesus' name.
for singing with us. You can have a seat. All right, you ready to dive in? Grab your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And while you're doing that, let me just say welcome to our Hope Creek friends. Glad to have you all with us again this morning. Are you all glad it's Christmas? Yeah. Are you really? Yeah. yeah, Christmas is a magical time of the year, isn't it? I mean, there's all the parties to go to, and you get to eat all the food that you're not supposed to eat that's really bad for you, and you feel okay about it during this time of the year, right? Yeah. There's the gifts and the trees and the lights and all that kind of stuff, as well as lots and lots and lots of Christmas music. Does anybody like Christmas music besides me? I love Christmas music. There's just one thing that I don't really like about it, and that's the fact that every year it seems like we started earlier and earlier and earlier. I swear, I heard Holly Jolly Christmas on Labor Day this year. There's something just wrong with that. That's just not quite right, you know? But I love Christmas music. And as much as I love it, when you look at some of the old traditional Christmas songs, some of the lyrics are just a little bit strange. Let me show you what I mean. Watch this video. But Christmas is kind of bittersweet for me because when I was a kid, my first time performing, I was six years old. And uh, I was performing in our Christmas pageant at church, and I had one line in one song. It was the song, Do You Hear What I Hear? And I messed it up. 
I sang, a child, a child, sleeping in the night with a tail as big as a kite. That's not the way that song goes, ladies and gentlemen. People get mad when you sing about baby Jesus with a tail. But think about that song, do you hear what I hear? It's psycho, who wrote that? Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy. I think the shepherd boy's been in the field a little too long, don't you? <laughs> Talking to the sheep. <laughs> nah! Really? <laughs> nah! Oh, we gotta tell the mighty king. It's worse, they go to the mighty king, <laughs> you know. A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. How about a blanket? How about some soup? Child shivered in the cold! Throw some gold on him, he'll be fine. <laughs> he's got pneumonia, but he's loaded. That kid is gonna be some. <laughs> well... With all the stuff and silliness like that that accompanies Christmas, it's easy for us to forget what Christmas is really all about. That's why we're doing this series entitled, So This is Christmas. And what we're doing in this series is unpacking together the announcement of the angels on that first Christmas 2,000 years ago. So let's take a look at it. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Now stop here for just a second. We've talked about this before, but some of you have never really heard about this. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, they always say the same thing. Don't be afraid. Why do they say that? Because everybody's scared when they show up. These are big, scary-looking dudes, and every time they show up, it scares the mess out of everybody. Now, I've had people say to me, Dave, I saw an angel the other night in my bedroom. It was so peaceful, so quiet, and so nice. You didn't see no angel. How do I know? Because you still got clean shorts on, that's why. Every time they show up, it just scares everybody to death. So he says, do not be afraid. And look at what he says next. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now, what we're doing in this series is unpacking this announcement. We're kind of doing it a segment at a time. And Jamie did a great job last week of kicking us off with the first segment, I bring you. The message of Christmas is a personal message. It's for you, it's for you, it's for you, it's for me. Jesus Christ came for each one of us personally and individually. But today I want to unpack the second segment of this. What is it that the angel is bringing? Now, obviously the angel didn't bring Jesus. Mary took care of that, right? So what is it that the angel brings? Well, he tells us what it is. He said, I bring you good news. Now, news is something that we're very familiar with, aren't we? In fact, we can kind of get a little overdosed on news. We got it coming at us from all directions. How many of you are like me and you remember the days when we only had three TV channels, though? How many of you remember that? Now stick your hand up, hold it up for just a second. If you have your hand in the air, do you know what you are? Old, Old exactly right. <laughs> but back in the day, we only had three channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And if you wanted to get the news, you either had to get up early in the morning, catch the morning news broadcast, or be home by 6 o'clock for the 6 o'clock news. That's the only two times of the day you could get the news, right? But then along came a guy named Ted Turner with a little thing called CNN, Cable News Network. And that changed everything, didn't it? Then guys along came ESPN, where we can get all the sports news. And now we've got Fox News, we've got MSNBC, uh, we've got headline news, we've got internet news sources, alternative news sources. We've got the Golf Channel bringing us golf news, CNBC, Fox Business Channel getting the business news. We've got news everywhere. Literally 24 hours a day, you can download the news from anywhere you want to be. It, the news is readily available to us. You know, I think we've become kind of like news junkies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some of you are sitting here right now. Since you've sat here this morning, you've already checked the headlines on your phone. And if I was sitting out there, I'd have done the same thing. I'm a news junkie too. We crave news, don't we? And you go back to the very first century, those people were un not unlike us. They craved news just like we do. Now, they didn't have the technology that we do to get news 24 hours a day, but they craved news just like you and I do. And here's one of the big reasons why they craved news so much. God had made them a promise. 
God had said, someday I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send a King, and He's going to lead you out of oppression. Isaiah 41, 27, He says, Look, help is on the way. I will send Jerusalem a messenger with good news. That was the prophecy that was given by Isaiah. But there's one problem with that. That prophecy came 700 years before this first Christmas night. And it's been 400 years since the people of Israel have heard anything at all from God. There's a 400-year silence gap between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So these people are craving good news from God. So it's into that context that, that the angel steps that, on that first Christmas night and says, I've got good news for you. Now, when he says, I've got good news, he uses a particular Greek word that I want to show you this morning. Okay? It's this word. This word. There it is. Eugalidzo. Say that out loud with me. Eugalidzo. One more time. Eugalidzo. And there's what it means. It means to declare good tidings. Now, this is the word that we get our word, evangelize, evangelism, evangelist. Those words all come from the word eugalidzo. It's also the word that we get our word gospel from. Gospel is actually a derivative of an old English word, Godspell. And that was the first word that they used to translate this word eugalidzo into the English. Godspell, gospel. So no matter how you slice it, good news, glad tidings, whatever you want to call it, here's what the angel said that, that night. I'm coming to bring you the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the word gospel is what we used to describe the first four books of the New Testament, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Now, Mark is actually the first one that was written, even though it's second in the lineup in the New Testament. It was the first one that was written. But look at what Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says about the book of Mark, about itself. This is the good news, the eugalidzo, about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The gospel of Mark is about Jesus. It's about him coming, it's about him living, it's about him dying, rising from the dead, doing everything that needed to be done so that you and I could be saved. And that's what all four of the Gospels are about. They're about the story of Jesus doing what it needed to be done so that you and I could be made right with him. That's the good news, that's the Gospel. But here's the big question. Is this good news for you and I today? You know, news is one thing, but is this news we can use? Well, the answer to that question is yes. Not only was it good news 2,000 years ago for the shepherds on a hillside, it's, two, it's, it's good news for you and I 2,000 years later. Let me give you two really big reasons why today, okay? You might want to write these two reasons down. Number one, it's good news because it tells me that I am no longer guilty. The gospel tells me I am no longer guilty. Have you ever had somebody say to you, I got good news and bad news. Which do you want to hear first? You ever had that? How many of you would say you wanted the bad news first? Okay, you guys are on track with me. I'm going to give you the bad news first, okay? Here's the bad news. Every one of us, every single one of us in this room, myself included, we are all sinners. Turn to the person next to you, shake your finger in their face, and say, you are a sinner. <laughs> now, some of you all enjoying that way too much. Turn the other way and say the same thing to the other person. <laughs> well, that's not just something to have a little fun with and make us laugh. That's what the Bible actually says. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone, who? Everyone. everyone has sinned. We all, how many of us? All. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. See, there's one thing that we all have in common. We're all sinners. We all fall short of God's standard. L let me show you what I mean. A little hand-raised survey, a little honesty time here this morning. Okay, ready? How many of you would say at least once in your life, you've told a little lie? At least once. Come on. Now, if you don't have your hand up, you're lying right now. So come on. <laughs> you know. All right? All of us are all. Okay? How many of you would say also at some point in time, you took something that wasn't exactly yours? Okay. Now, you know what that makes us? Liars and thieves. Oh, now, Dave, I wouldn't call it that. I wouldn't call myself a liar or a thief. I mean, Dave, it was just a little white lie. And that thing that I took is just some paper clips from the office. I wouldn't exactly call myself a liar or a thief. Well, that's what the Bible calls you. That's only two of the Ten Commandments. We're all sinners. But, Dave, I'm a good person. Well, good, I'm glad you are. But let me ask you a question. Are you a perfect person? No. You see that standard that Romans 3.23 talks about, that standard that we fall short of? That's the standard. 100% perfection. 
Total righteousness, total holiness. Anybody here match up to that? Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah. See, the bad news is we all sin, we all fall short. And here's what that does to us. It separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, the problem is your sins have cut you off from God. Our sin literally creates a gap between us and God. So if you've ever had that feeling like you're a million miles away from God, if you ever felt like you were praying and your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling, there's a reason why. Your sin has created a gap between you and God. The bad news this morning is that you and I are all sinners. We all fall short of God's standard. We're all hopelessly separated from God. Now you ready for the good news? That was the bad news. Good news, ready? Okay, okay. Romans 3, 20, uh, 24 and 25, yet God, I love those two words. We all sin, we all fall short, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. And people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. The bad news is we're all sinners. The bad news is we all fall short. The bad news is we're all separated from God. The good news is Jesus Christ came to do everything that you and I could not do and do it for us. He came and lived a sinless, perfect life. And then he went to the cross and he made the great exchange for you and I. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness. He took my mess and gave me his holiness. He took all my wrong and gave me his right. And now the Bible says, if I will just believe in what he did on the cross, that he shed his blood for me on the cross, if I put my faith and trust in that, I'm forgiven. I'm no longer guilty and I'm no longer condemned. Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The good news is, I'm not condemned. Not because of what I do or don't do, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. That's the good news. That's the message of Christmas. And you know what? It's the message of this church too. You know, one of the things I love about our church is that we just preach the gospel here. Very pure, very plain, very simple. And that catches people off guard sometimes. You know what the number one thing is people say to me about our church? Dave, I've never been to a church like this before. Anybody ever heard that from somebody? Yeah. I've never been to a church like this before. And you know what, you know what they mean when they say that? They're not talking about the music. They're not talking about the preaching. They're not talking about the building, the campus, the programs, or stuff like that. They're talking about you guys when they say that. Because inevitably, here's what they follow it up with. I've never felt loved like these people here love me. I've never felt accepted like this. I've never been to a church where I didn't feel like somebody was looking down their nose judging me, and I don't feel that way here. You know why? Because this is a place of the gospel. This is a place of good news. That's why they don't feel that way. I was talking to a young lady just a few weeks ago. She was telling me about her husband who never attended church, never wanted to attend church. And he said all the things that people always say about churches. Oh, just full of a bunch of hypocrites, you know, just judgmental. I don't want to go. She finally got him to come here. And she said on that Sunday morning when he first visited, she said, I looked over at him in the middle of the service. He had big tears running down his cheeks. Why? Because this is a place of good news. Not condemnation. Not judgment. It's a place of good news. It's a place of the gospel. It's a place where you can hear and experience the gospel. And listen, if you came here today and you have never experienced the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, let me just tell you, you can experience it before you leave this place today. You can walk out of here knowing that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins, that your sins have been forgiven, and that you are no longer guilty, no longer condemned. Is that good news? Is that news you can use? I think so. But there's a second facet to the gospel, and that's that I am a friend of God. The gospel says I am a friend of God. Bad news, good news again? The bad news is, for some of us, Christmas isn't exactly the hap happiest time of the year. For example, for some of us, it's a time that we're reminded of, of the brokenness in our family. How many of you have at least one weird family member in your family? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We've all got one, haven't we? Now, they're sitting next to you. Don't turn and look at them right now. <laughs> and if you're sitting here right now thinking, I don't know, I, I, I can't think of a weird family member. <laughs> guess what that makes you <laughs> or maybe you've lost a loved one this year through divorce or separation or some kind of conflict or maybe you've had a loved one who passed away this year and you're going to be facing the first Christmas without that person in your life or in your family you know Christmas for some of us can be a very very lonely time 
But the good news is, God, because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, because we're in Christ, God looks at us as his friend. We have a friendship relationship with the God of the universe. Romans 5.11 says, So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Yeah. Because of Jesus, I am a friend of God. Say that with me. I am? Okay, let's do this right. Okay, I'll... I'll say the first part, you repeat it, okay? I am a friend of God. Oh, that sounds great. Say it again. I am a friend of God. And you know what? That's something you can't get from any other religious system. You can't get it anywhere. Through Jesus Christ, I have direct access to the God of the universe. I don't need a priest. I don't need a guru. I don't need some spiritual leader, some spiritual teacher. I don't need anything like that. Because of Jesus, I have direct access to the God of the universe. I am... A friend of God. Again, you can't get that from any other religion. Now, they've got some rules for you to follow. They've got some teachings for you to follow. They've got some rituals for you to perform and stuff like that. But, hey, no amount of rules, no amount of rituals, no amount of anything like that, none of that stuff will make you what God wants you to be. And let me just take that a step further. This church can't make you into what God wants you to be, God created you to be. We can't do it. This church can't fix your marriage. This church can't fix your kids. This church can't fix your life. But we can introduce you to the one who can. His name is Jesus. Is that good news? Is that news you can use? Yeah, I think so. The good news is through Jesus Christ I can be forgiven. I don't have to live in shame and guilt and condemnation. I can live without that mess. I can be free from it. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, I have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. That is really, really monumental good news. But here's the really big question this morning. What do you do with that kind of good news? What do you do with that? How do you respond to that kind of news? Think about it this way. When you get really good news, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to tell somebody, don't you? And that's the third facet of the gospel that we need to understand. The gospel was meant to be shared. It was meant to be told to other people. And here we are, we find ourselves right now in the middle of the Christmas season, which just happens to be the number one inviting opportunity that we have in the whole year. We've talked about this before. Your friends, your family members, your neighbors, your coworkers, people that you know, love, and care about who are far from God, they are more likely to accept an invitation to church at this time of the year than at any other time. It's number one inviting opportunity. And our Christmas services are just around the corner. So what I want to try to do for the next few minutes is try to get us into the mindset where we can take advantage of this opportunity to share the gospel. Because that's the purpose of Christmas, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, do you really think the purpose of Christmas is so you can go shopping on Black Friday? Is that what Christmas is all about? By the way, what's up with Black Friday? That has gotten seriously jacked up recently, hasn't it? I heard a story the other day about a woman who went to this store on Black Friday, and she was trying to get a video game for her kid, and she wanted to make sure that nobody else got to the video game, so she whipped out her pepper spray and sprayed everybody around her so that she could get to the video game first. That's jacked up. That's kind of missing the point, isn't it? The point of Christmas is to declare that the Messiah has come. And make no mistake about it, as the church, we are commissioned by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to do exactly that. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Mark records the same thing in chapter 16, verse 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Now, what is this called? Somebody tell me what this is called. The Great Commission, exactly. And there's two things that you and I need to understand about the Great Commission this morning. Number one, The Great Commission is a command. It's a command. Jesus doesn't say, I hope you'll consider this. Can I make a suggestion to you? I mean, I know you're really busy at this time of the year. You've got to get to Walmart and get that special something for that special someone. You've got parties to go to and food to make and all that kind of stuff. But could you just do me a personal favor and preach the gospel? No, that's not what Jesus says. He says, look. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am large and in charge here, okay? And as your Lord, I'm giving you marching orders. I want you to go out and preach the gospel. And notice how he says this. 
I want you to go and preach the gospel. He doesn't say, I want you to sit in church and wait for them to come. Go get them and bring them in. And I think way too often, as Christians, we tend to try to isolate ourselves from non-believers in our lives. You know, you know what I'm talking about? We try to isolate ourselves. We want to get up in the morning, have our nice little Bible study, do our quiet time with you version or something like that, and then drive to work, you know, listening to K-Love all the way to work, you know. And then when I get to work, i got to hang out with all those pagans, those heathens that I work with. They're always telling dirty jokes and cussing and partying and messing around, all that. I wish I could work someplace where everybody was a Christian. Let me tell you, I work someplace like that. It ain't all it's cracked up to be. But we do. We try to isolate ourselves. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Seinfeld episode about the bubble boy. Remember bubble boy? Let me show you a picture of bubble boy here. That's bubble boy. Now, bubble boy had a problem with his immune system, so he lived in this plastic bubble to keep from getting infected by germs out there in the world. Well, as Christians, sometimes I think we're trying to create a little bubble for ourselves and kind of just be bubble Christians. You know, kind of keep all, the, all that nasty stuff away from us. Well, listen, Jesus didn't call us to isolate. He called us to infiltrate, to go and be out there where they're at and preach the gospel. So number one, we need to understand the Great Commission is a command. Number two, we need to understand that it's a command for every believer. The Great Commission wasn't given just to the apostles. It wasn't given to just the church professionals. In fact, it was given to the entire church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul details a time when Jesus, after his resurrection, met with over 500 of the believers all together at the same time. In other words, he appeared to the whole church. And most scholars believe that that was where he gave the Great Commission, in front of the entire church. So this is a command that has been given to you and I, to every one of us as believers, to go and preach the gospel. So let me ask you a question today. How are you doing with this one? How are you doing at preaching the gospel? How are you doing at going to the world? Well, now, Dave, come on. Yeah, I, I can't, there's no way I can do this. I can't go to the world and preach the gospel. You know what? You're exactly right. Probably none of us in this room will ever have a worldwide opportunity to get up in front of you know, a worldwide audience and preach the gospel. We probably won't have that. So here's what we've got to do. We've got to localize this idea. Go into your world. Your world. It starts with your family your household, your neighborhood, your school, your office, the place where you work. You go into your sphere of influence. You go into your world and preach the gospel in your world. And let me just say something about this this morning that's going to kind of catch some of you off guard a little bit. It's going to kind of make some of you go, whoa. may even tick some of you off a little bit. If this is a command from Jesus to us and we do not do it, that makes it sin <gasps> how can you say that Dave just because I don't tell people about Jesus that's a sin how can that be well there are two types of sin in the scriptures sins of commission sins of omission Sunday school teacher got up in front of her class one morning and said now kids we're going to talk about sin today and there are two types of sin there's sins of commission sins of omission can somebody tell me what a sin of commission is little girl on the front row raised her hand and said, I know, teacher, I know. She said, a sin of commission is when you do something you're not supposed to do. You do something wrong. The teacher said, that's exactly right. That's what a sin of commission is. Now, can somebody tell me what a sin of omission is? little boy on the back row raised his hand and said, I know, I know. He said, that's a sin you really want to do, but you just haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> A sin of commission is indeed when we do something that we're not supposed to do. We do something wrong. A sin of omission is when we know that something is right, and we know the right thing to do, and we fail to do it. That's a sin of omission. James 4, 17 says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, does what? What's it say? He sins. It's a sin of omission. So think about it this way. Let's say after church is over, you go to Golden Corral or McDonald's or wherever you're going to go for lunch, and you get your lunch, and then you head for home. And you come down the street and you round the corner towards your house and all of a sudden you notice your neighbor's house is on fire. And as you're looking at the house, you see through the living room window, you see him sitting in his lazy boy watching the game on the big screen TV. He has no idea that his house is on fire. 
Now, what are you going to do? Pull in your driveway, look at each other and say, neighbor's house is on fire. Let's pray for him. And then just go in the house? Would that be the right thing to do? What would the right thing be to do? You go pound on the door. You say, hey, neighbor, your house is on fire. Come on, get out of there. You'd break down the door. You'd drag him out if you had to. You'd do whatever it took to get him out of that situation, wouldn't you? That would be the right thing to do. Well, here's the deal. Every single one of us here today, we all know somebody who by how they live their lives, somebody in our life, we know how they're living their life. We know that they're not a Christ follower by the way they're living their lives. And their house isn't on fire. Their life is on fire. And you know what the outcome of that's going to be. You know what their eternal destiny is looking like right now. And you know the answer is Jesus. So what are you going to do? Nothing? Pray for them? Not say anything? What are you going to do? Well, Dave, I, I'm living a good example in front of them. Well, good. I'm glad you're doing that. But Jesus doesn't say, go into all the world and live a good example. He says, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. You've got to verbalize it. You've got to tell them. Here's the reason why. Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one in whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Somebody needs to tell them. It needs to be verbalized. You've got to tell them the good news. And part of telling them the good news is telling them the bad news. Hey, neighbor, your life is on fire. In way too many areas today, in way too many churches, we're offering a very watered-down gospel. We're offering Jesus as an additive to your life. Hey, you want your life to go better? Try a little Jesus. Want your marriage to get fixed? Try a little Jesus. You want your kids to be happier? Try a little Jesus. You want whiter breath, fresh or whiter teeth, fresher breath, spring in your step? Try a little Jesus. Listen, that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that all humanity, you, me, the Pope, Billy Graham, every single one of us, we are all hopelessly lost. We are sinners who have fallen short of the standard. We're separated from God, and there's no way we can bridge that gap. But Jesus, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came into this world to do for us what we can't do for ourselves, to live a perfect life, and then to go to the cross and pay the price for our sins. And if I just turn away from my sin and turn towards Him, I can be saved. That is the message of the gospel. That is the message of Christmas. And that is the message of this church. So, New Horizon, here's our mission. To help as many people as we possibly can to have an encounter with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our mission statement. So we need to go and preach the gospel. Well, Dave, that's hard. I mean, I'm not a preacher like you are. It's hard to do what you do. You know what? I understand that. And that's why we've designed this church the way we've designed it. We've designed this church to be a partnership. And here's how the partnership works. You have people in your life that you know, love, and care about who are far from God right now. They don't know Jesus. They need to hear the gospel. And if you will bring them, if you'll bring them to this church, here's what we promise you we'll do when, when you get them here. We promise you they will get a clear presentation of Jesus and an opportunity to respond to the gospel. It won't be perfect all the time. I'm not the perfect preacher. This is not the perfect church. But I guarantee you, by the end of the day, we'll do those two things. We'll present Jesus clearly and give them an opportunity to respond to the gospel. So, New Horizon, can we make a commitment to that this, this Christmas? Let's make a commitment to two things. It's two weeks until Christmas. We've got two more services together. Let's celebrate the gospel these next two Sundays. Can we do that? Can we just celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ? That's what Christmas is. It's about the good news. So let's celebrate. Let's make a commitment to doing that. And then number two, let's make a commitment to being a bringer. Get a whole handful of these little suckers, these little tickets. Get a handful of them on your way out today. They're out in the lobby. Get a handful and take them to everybody you know and say, come with me to Christmas Eve services at New Horizon, 2, 4, or 6 o'clock, whichever one you choose. But let's be a bringer this Christmas. Let's celebrate 
and let's share the gospel. Say this with me. This Christmas, I will be a bringer. Say it again. This Christmas, I will be a bringer. If you and I will do that, we'll see tons of people come to Christ this Christmas. Wouldn't that be good news? Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the hope that we find in you. Thank you for the good news of the gospel, the good news that says that even though we're sinners separated from you, we can be made right with you, that we can be forgiven, lacking, totally, totally forgiven for all of our guilt, our sin, all of it wiped out, no condemnation. Thank you that we can have that in you. And I thank you today that we can have a relationship with you that's a friendship relationship, that we can call you our friend, that we can say, I am a friend of God. Father, I pray right now for any person in this room that's never experienced that, they've never experienced the gospel, they don't know what it's like to be a friend of God, they don't know what it's like to be forgiven. I pray that in these next few moments that you will help them to be drawn to you. Draw them by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Do what only you can do. Bring them to a place where they accept you as their Savior and their Lord. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment. I wonder how many of you here this morning would just be willing to be honest with me and say, Dave, I need to have my sins forgiven. I need to know that I'm right with God. I need to know that I'm on my way to heaven when I die. And I want that today. I, I want to be right with God. I want my sins to be forgiven. Dave, would you pray for me? And I'd love to do that. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray with you. But here's what I need. I need to know who needs to pray that way. I need to know who I'm praying with and praying for this morning. So in just a moment when I say so, I'm going to ask you just to stick your hand up in the air. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you, call on you, make you stand, come to the front. All I'm going to ask you to do is just raise your hand and look up at me till I can look you in the eye and acknowledge you. Then we're going to pray together. You're going to stay right where you're at. I'm going to stay right where I'm at. So right now, all around the room, yes, ma'am, God bless you. Anybody else? Just stick it up high. God, sir, God bless you. Sir, God bless you. Ma'am, God bless you. Yes, right here. One, two, three. Yeah, four of you right here. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, way back there in the back. Yes, right down here. Ma'am, sir. Gals, got you. Yes, sir, over here. Sir? Yes, way back in the back, sir. Yes, sir, right over here. I see you. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you. Yes, ma'am, I see you. Ma'am, I see you. Anybody else? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together, and we're going to pray out loud together. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, Christian or not, I'm going to ask you all to pray out loud with me, okay? Those of you who are Christians, we're going to do this in support of all these folks that have just raised their hands. But I want you to pray out loud, and the operative word there is loud. I want you to pray loud enough that the person sitting next to you can hear you pray. This is nothing to be ashamed of this morning, okay? So here we go. Everybody ready? Here we go. Jesus, I am a sinner. I need to be saved. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead so that I could be saved today. I ask you to come into my heart, come into my life, cleanse me, save me, power wash my soul, make me what you want me to be. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord, as my God, as my King, as my Savior. Everything I am is now yours. I surrender to you. Take control, Jesus. From here on out, I am yours. Father, I pray right now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will seal these hearts. Seal the deal so that they know that they know that they know that right now, as of now, their sins are forgiven and they're a new person in Jesus Christ. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. If you just prayed with me and you're committing your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time, maybe you're coming back to Jesus, whatever the case may be, I want to encourage you to stop by prayer and care. That's the area right back over here where there's a bunch of tables and chairs. There'll be some friendly folks there to greet you. They would love to give you one of these. It's a getting started kit. It contains a free Bible as well as some helpful information that will get you started in your relationship with Jesus. So stop by, talk to them, grab one of these on the way out. No strings attached. I'm not going to ask you to drink funny Kool-Aid or anything like that, okay? Just good, helpful stuff, okay? 
then grab some tickets on your way out, pass them out to everybody you know, and come back next week. We're going to be in the third part of our series. Next week we're doing communion, Christmas offering. It's going to be a great, great day next weekend. We'll see you all then. So let's stand. Let's stand. Say it with me one more time. I am a friend of God. Say it again. I am a friend of God. Let's sing about it now. That you hear me when I call. Is it true you are thinking of me? How you love me.